Good evening, America. I'm Brian Garland. Welcome to the 5-Minute News Hour. Could you find it all right? Yeah? Sorry, they're doing construction out by the internet, so you had to go around the internet in order to find it here on the internet. 5-Minute News Hour begins now! Good evening. I'm Brian Gartland. Our top story this evening, Afghanistan's President Hamid Karzai demanded Thursday that the U.S. withdraw to large NATO bases and give up their dangerous nighttime raids of suspected insurgents and demanded that the U.S. start acquiring warrants before entering civilian homes in the wake of a U.S. staff sergeant who was alleged to have killed 16 Afghan civilians over the weekend. The Afghan people want us to remove our large occupational army and are demanding the abolition of illegal search and seizure? asked Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, who is in the country, to survey the aftermath of the terrible incident. What do they think this is? 18th century America? Panetta then looked around, gathered what he saw, and said, Well, if the shoe fits. At which point, radical students burned a well-fitting shoe in effigy. And while President Karzai is powerless to enforce his demand to the U.S. Armed Forces, Public sentiment in both Afghanistan and America have shifted away from the war. Many arguing that the war has grown depressing and stale like the American office, while others say it's gone on way too long and is very maudlin like MASH. In any event, the finale is well looked forward to. And on a serious note, friend of the show and lifelong board dork Robert Worley is currently serving in Afghanistan risking life and limb fighting for a country that despite its checkered past, checkered present, and unknown future, I am very, very proud to call my home. Thank you, Robbie, and thank you to every single man and woman who has, or who will, fight in honor of this country. For real. Thank you. Back home in the good old United States of A this week, President Obama was focusing on hosting British Prime Minister David Cameron. And although the two politicians are separated by the Atlantic Ocean in political ideology, Obama an American liberal and Cameron a British conservative, the two are both young and energetic politicians with a lot in common. In fact, at 43, when Cameron was elected to be a prime minister, he was the youngest man or woman to achieve the office since the second Earl of Liverpool in 1812. Cameron made light reference to his predecessor, young at the time, currently long dead, which, uh... Standing in front of the White House, which was burned during the War of 1812, Cameron told the press he was a little embarrassed by what his ancestors had done years ago, quipping in his dry British way that you've got the place a little better defended today. At which point the ghost of Dolly Madison said, Yeah, really funny, you stupid limey bastard, and then high-fived the racist old ghost of uh, Andrew Jackson. They were quickly told to keep it down, however, by Teddy and Franklin Roosevelt, who were busy schooling the Adams boys in a ghostly game of White House Flip Cup. All true. As March Madness grips the country tighter than a toddler having been given a rocket pop, President Obama took Prime Minister David Cameron to a play-in game earlier this week. The two young family men bonded during the game, with Obama explaining as much of the sport as he could, and then nodding and smiling politely as Cameron explained to him Britain's boring baseball, or what I'm being told here is called cricket. Now that can't be right. I will leave America with some new words, Cameron told the press. Alley-oops, fast breaks, good thing it's not two weeks ago or I would have had to pretend to give a shit about Lynn's sanity. Cameron then patiently explained that it was pronounced Downton, not Downtown, that it depends on who you were raised on and everyone has their own favorite doctor, there is no wrong answer to that question, then took out his umbrella and floated peacefully home, carefully avoiding Boston and New York, close as it is to St. Patrick's Day. And now for a segment I like to call, Oh No! Like so many other stars, Tiny Till's candle burned out long before its legend ever will. The three-week-old German rabbit, born without ears but with an abundance of adorable, was tragically stepped on to death Wednesday in an East German zoo. We are all shocked. During the filming, the cameraman took a step back and trod on the bunny, zoo director Uwe Damwolf told the press. He was immediately dead. He didn't suffer. It was a direct hit. 
No one could have ever foreseen this. Everyone here is upset. The cameraman was distraught. Added everyone else. Oh no! Beware the Ides of March! No, it's not just an incredibly lazy review of that Ryan Gosling, George Clooney political thriller. Jesus, Gosling and Clooney in the same movie? How did, how did people concentrate? Huh? Philip Seymour Hoffman and Paul Giamatti? Well, yeah, that, that'll do it. That'll even it out. Anyway, the 15th or middle of March is a famous day in history, bringing us to today's what I call Today, Back Then. Gaius Julius Caesar came from a very popular and very powerful Roman family and was a popular and powerful general in his own right, conquering much of what we call Gaul. Well, knowing the French as we know them today, that can be argued not to be much of an accomplishment. Anyway, as Caesar gained power in Gaul and gathered the love of his troops, he entered into a three-way political alliance with an old guy named Crassus and the big cheese in Rome at the time named Pompey. So later, Crassus dies, and Pompey and the Roman Senate start to worry that Caesar's getting a little too powerful out there in Gaul. So they call him to come back home and relinquish his title of Governor of Gaul. Well, Caesar comes back home, but he brings all of his armies, thus breaking the most important rule of Roman law. Don't bet on baseball. No, wait, that was Pete Rose. Uh, he crossed the Rubicon. He brought his troops with him into Rome. So, on the middle, in the middle of March, on March 15th and 44 BC, the Roman Senate took the Republic back by force, stabbing Caesar, the tribune, or dictator at the time, 23 times. Uh, Caesar was reportedly warned that his death or some kind of danger would come during or before the Ides of March, and that morning is reported to have told a friend, well, the Ides of March are here and I'm still fine, to which the friend responded, well, the Ides of March aren't gone, so... In retrospect, one of history's dickiest moves. So, uh, the moral of the story is that you can't trust your friends. And... What are you doing? Where did you get that knife? No. No! A2 Beasley!